look at it, the cover has a foreword by R.C. Sproul, which at our house was a highly respected, uh, he's worldwide highly respected, but for our family, we, we appreciated his ministry. And so I'm thinking, okay, it's been two and a half years of putting down every End Times book I've picked up, but I hear the Holy Spirit say to me, it's time. Pick that up and get it. I'm going to begin to teach you. And so that was the first book that started to unravel all the fear about the end times. Now it's been about, this is about 12 years later, and having put out Rapturalists and having taught this all over the country, and, and it, it's a whole different space that I'm in now, it is my honor and privilege to welcome our guest speaker tonight, the same man that I didn't recognize his name originally, and for those that are watching on, on the school all around the world, uh, I just want, I want you to understand that every person that I've had as a guest speaker in the school is a wholehearted endorsement from me. So anything that you find from Gary DeMar, and he has countless books and writings, AmericanVision.org, and go check it out. I love his ministry. I love what they're doing, and I highly endorse it. So please go check that out. Would you stand and welcome our guest tonight? Mr. Gary DeMar. Thank you. Thanks. So we have until about 7.30, okay? And then we'll take okay. It. Yeah, my, my watch is an hour ahead, so I have to, but I'll figure it, I'll figure it out halfway through. Well, it's good to be here. I have some connection with the area. My wife's mother and aunt live in Tuscumbia, which is right down the road from you all, so I'm kind of familiar, <clears throat> familiar with the area. I'm, I live in Marietta, Georgia, which is a little north of Atlanta. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, grew up there, and um, I was raised Roman Catholic, where eschatology really wasn't that much of an issue. Um, and everything was, was really around the sacrifice of the Mass. I don't know if, how many people are familiar with the Roman Catholic Church. I went to church, of course, every Sunday. I was an altar boy for the, for the longest time. It was because I, I couldn't sing. All the kids who sang went off to the choir, and the people who were left ended up having to be altar boys, and that's how I got to be an altar boy. I did learn some Latin as a result of that. Those were the days when the Mass was in Latin. I eventually went with an English mass and turned the altar around. So I was kind of right in the middle of all that. So I always believed in God. I uh, never had a problem with that. Learned the Apostles' Creed, learned the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but when I saw Jesus hanging on the cross every Sunday, because if you go into a, a Protestant church, you'll see that the cross is empty. Uh, you go into a Catholic church, Jesus is still hanging on the cross. He has to be sacrificed over and over and over again every week. And so you need the Catholic church in order to stay in the graces of the, of, of, of the church. And, and so it was never a time I didn't, I didn't believe in God. Knew nothing about the Bible. And I was, I was a student at, at Western Michigan University. I was out there on a track and field scholarship. Uh, I was a nationally ranked high school shot putter uh, when I was in high school. I used to hold the Pennsylvania state record in, in the shot put. If you don't know what the shot put is, in high school it's a 12-pound ball and you push it to see how far you can throw it. And that was my claim, that was my claim to fame in high school was pushing the 12-pound ball. Uh, but it got me to college and it was my senior year in college in 1973 that someone sat down with me and it started talking about Bible prophecy. And I really, Bible prophecy wasn't the issue for me. My life was just a plain mess. Uh, I had gone from being a nationally ranked high school athlete to being an also ran in college and really had nothing else to fall back on. And religion at the time really didn't make much of a difference to me. I just I didn't really, I didn't think about it very much at all. But I ran into an old high school friend in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and he sat down and he started talking about the end times and eschatology, actually uh, Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth, if you, some of you may remember, remember that. And I was intrigued enough to start picking up the Bible and started reading the Bible. And I started reading, most people say, here, read the Gospel of John. But I started with, I had an old 
uh, military New Testament. When my father served in World War II in Korea, and all the soldiers would get a, a, a pocket New Testament. And that's all I had in terms of the Bible. And I started reading at the beginning, which you would expect to read, rather than at the fourth book. You, I started reading with the first book, which, which was Matthew's Gospel. And I came across a couple of passages in Matthew's Gospel that felt that were awfully confusing to me, given what Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth was all about. And again, I'm coming in, kind of coming in the middle of all of this, but let me kind of give you the background. This was in 1970. Hal Lindsey had written a true blockbuster. It was, it was named the number one nonfiction book of the 1970s, sold tens of millions of copies. Now, I want you to keep this in mind. The Left Behind series has sold probably the name, let's, let's round it off and let's say 100 million copies. But you're combining, I don't know, 15 volumes. Well, Late Great Planet Earth in the 1970s uh, sold by itself close to 30 million copies. It was hugely influential. And it had made something of a prediction. It had said that uh, Israel became a nation again in 1948, and that was prophetically significant. In fact, it was the keystone prophetic uh, event that would set the last days in motion. So Israel becomes a nation again in 1948. Then Hal Lindsey goes to Matthew chapter 24. In Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse, you've got Mark 13, Luke 21. These are parallel accounts. And many people believe that the book of Revelation is actually John's version of the Olivet Discourse, uh, portrayed more in a symbolic way than the Olivet Discourse is. And Hal Lindsey said that a generation where it says Matthew chapter 24, 34, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place, that a generation was 40 years. Well, you can do the math. 1948 plus 40 gave you 1988. So everything really should have come to a close before 1988. The rapture, that is the church being taken off the earth, should have taken place prior to 1988. Another big advocate of this uh, was Chuck Smith. Chuck Smith, who just died this year, uh, made very similar predictions about the 1948-1988 paradigm. And he said the rapture was going to take place in 1981. And I have a sermon that he give, gave on the, on the eve of 1981 where he makes this prediction. Uh, it may have been in the eve of 1980. He makes, made this prediction uh, that we're coming to the, we're the rapture generation, which was a, which was a phrase that Hal Lindsey had, had, uh, had coined. And so here I am, a new Christian, uh, being introduced to all this through Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth, reading what he says about this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And I'm reading Matthew's Gospel, and then I get to a couple of passages that just didn't seem to fit. And I'm going to give them to you. You may know these already, but it won't hurt to refresh yourselves. Uh, chapter 10 of Matthew, it says, the first, verse, the first verse says, And having summoned his twelve disciples, he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. And he lists the names of them, and he sends them out. And, of course, they come back jubilant that even the demons are subject to them. Uh, and in verse 23 well, verse 22, um, it says, And you will be hated by all on account of my name, but is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. And now, you would, at that particular time, I get to that verse, and I said, okay, that makes sense. It's at the end. Everybody's going to be saved at the end. Verse 23, But whenever they persecute you in this city, flee to the next for truly I say to you, you shall not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. And that verse stopped me dead in my tracks. I wasn't much of a Bible scholar. In fact, I wasn't a Bible scholar at all. I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know what this verse was supposed to say, given what I had learned from the late great planet Earth. What this passage was telling me that... 
Jesus had a particular audience in mind. He, had a, he was talking to his disciples, the one he had called, the ones he was sending out. He says, and you will be hated by all on account of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who shall, will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in this city, flee to the next, for truly I say to you, you shall not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. Now, put yourself in the place of that first audience that Jesus spoke to. Who would you think Jesus was talking to if he said, for truly I say to you, you shall not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. Who would you think he was talking to? He was talking to you. He didn't have some unnamed, distant future generation in mind. He had them in mind. But then mixed in all this, it says, until the Son of Man comes. So my mind is whirling. I said, wait a minute. I thought the coming of the Son of Man, that doesn't happen until... Well, it hasn't happened yet. This was 1973. It hadn't happened yet. So how could the Son of Man, how could they have finished going to the cities of Israel and this persecution taking place until the Son of Man comes? So I was really confused. And I, I chalked it up to my ignorance of the Bible, which is not a bad, by the way, that's not a bad thing to do. Better to chalk it up to your ignorance than it is to say, I think I've got this figured out. And that's what too many people do, or they go running to some book somewhere and let some other person tell them what the text means and having to do all sorts of exegetical gerrymandering in order to make it fit an already, already designed paradigm. So I just, kept, I just kept reading, and I got to this other passage. I got Matthew chapter 16. Um, and I won't go through the whole context of this. Uh, verse, verses 26 uh, in 27 and 28, Jesus says, For what will, it, will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Verse 27, For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and will then recompense every man according to his deeds. Which, by the way, is a, is a direct quotation from an Old Testament passage. And one of the things that you do when you read the Bible uh, you want to cross-reference. You want to say, well, uh, that sounds familiar. Let me see where else that's found in the Bible. And that is, in fact, uh, found elsewhere in Scripture. So you really need to go back and see what that particular passage meant back then and, not, and because Jesus had a context in mind. So he then will run, recompense every man according to his deeds. And by the way, the word every and all in Scripture is another indicator of you need to be be careful the way when you see the word every and all. Um, because a lot of times every and all just means everybody without exception, not, not everybody, it, it, not every single individual. Um, and it, it doesn't leave any class out. Uh, when John is baptizing, it says all, all, of, all of Jerusalem came down, or all of Judea came down. Well, so there was a couple of people who probably didn't come down, so be careful with the word all. You you, you go to a football game around here, and you say, who was there? Well, everybody was there. Well, you don't say, well, everybody? Everybody in the whole world was there? Well, you don't do that. You just, all your friends and so forth. The place was packed. That's what it means in many cases. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And that one really hurt me. Because this meant that whatever this was talking about, whatever coming this was talking about, it had to have taken place before the last person in this group to whom Jesus was speaking died. Somebody still had to be alive. Now there's actually a view out there that teaches that somebody is still alive. Now this is the extreme that some, some interpretive principle uh, and paradigms will go to. Well, there's got to be somebody still alive. If you get to the end of John's gospel, you'll, you'll see the same, type of, the same type of indicator. So somebody's still alive today. No. Part of the thing that we've got to understand here is, is that how does the Bible use the word, the, 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 the phrase, the coming of the Son of Man? And how would you figure that out? How would you figure out what the coming of the Son of Man means? Where would you go to find out? Where's the first place you should go? 
you've got to go back to the Old Testament. Are there places in the Old Testament where, where God comes to Israel in a non-physical way? Well, they're, they're all over the Old Testament. I'll, we'll touch on a couple of those in a, in, a, in a moment. But truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So this event had to be far enough in the future that nearly everybody in this group was dead, but not so far that everybody was dead. Now some people say, well, this is the transfiguration. The transfiguration, which was 10 days later. Well, nobody had died within 10, uh, 10 days. And some people will say, well, this is talking about the second coming of Christ. Well, I can't refer to that because it says some of those who are standing here will not taste death. Some of these people still had to be alive when this event took place. And the only event that really fits this is the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in, in A.D. 70, which Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 talk about. So that's an event that's far enough in the future that lots of people would, would die, but not so far that everybody would have died. And sure enough, when you go through the book of Acts, what do you find? There, a lot of the early Christians died. You had Stephen, who was executed, and James, the brother of John, is executed. Uh, we learned through tradition that Peter and Paul were executed under, under Nero. Uh, John is, seems to be the only one who, who lived um, uh, into, the, into the 90s. Uh, but you've, you've got, this, you've got this, the context here fits this very, very well. And so here I am, a new Christian, just be, being told that Jesus is going to return to rapture his church prior to 1988, because that's what the Bible teaches, and yet when I start reading Matthew's gospel, I see a different picture being painted in terms of Bible prophecy. But remember, I'm ignorant. I don't know anything about the Bible at this stage in my life. But I keep reading, and I get to Matthew chapter 23. And I get to Matthew chapter 23, and I notice, while I may be ignorant, I'm not stupid. Uh, and there's a difference. You can be ignorant about a lot of things, but you don't, you don't have to be stupid. I just read an article today where this, this homeless man uh, was begging for money so he could buy food. And this computer programmer went up to him and said, what if I teach you how to program instead of giving you the money? The guy said, okay. So this computer program, programmer taught this homeless man how to program, and he's good enough now to be able to go out and get a job. There's, there's a huge, huge lesson in there, but my point is he was ignorant about computer programming, but he wasn't stupid when he was exposed to the rudimentary way of programming. So keep those two. So when someone says you're ignorant, you may be, <laughs> but you're probably not stupid. Uh, you're probably very, very smart in a whole lot of different areas. So I'm not stupid, and so I'm reading Matthew chapter 23, and it's obvious here that Jesus has a particular audience in mind. Uh, and, you, and then you get to verse 31 of Matthew 23. It says, Consequently, you bear witness against yourselves that you are sons of those who murder the prophets. Fill up in the measure of the guilt of your fathers, you serpents, you brood of vipers. How shall you escape the sentence of hell? Do you think, are you... Smart enough to identify the audience here? Yeah, it's, it's those people to whom Jesus is speaking, which are identified in the, first, in the first two verses. Spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples. Uh, Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues, which again shows to show you the the, the, the particular historical context of the period, and persecute from city to city, which takes you back to Matthew chapter 10, verse 23, that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things shall come upon this generation. And so I'm reading this particular passage, and I see very clearly here that the, this generation refers to their generation, not a distant future generation. Okay? And by the way, I won't go into the details of this, but this passage where it says, uh, 
the, from the righteous blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. A lot of people have trouble with that, that passage uh, because there is no uh, Zechariah, son of Berechiah, from the Old Testament who, who actually did this. And there's a, there is a son of, there's Zechariah, son of Berechiah in one place, and there is a Zechariah somewhere else who does this killing, but there isn't a son of Berechiah who kills, um, who, who who, who was murdered between the temple and the altar. And all kinds of people have tried to figure out what this is, what this means. Is it a mistake? Is it, anyway, I think you take it just the way it says. Uh, these people killed a Zechariah son of Berechiah, whom you murdered. And if you go back to the Old Testament, you'll notice how many times, how many Zacharias there are. What is John the Baptist's father's name? Zechariah. Berechiah is another common name, so it wouldn't be beyond the realm of possibilities to see that in this New Testament period, there is, in fact, a guy named Zechariah, son of Berechiah. Some have even postulated that's who John the Baptist's father, that's who he was. He was Zechariah, son of Berechiah. That can't be proved, but it is, it's a possibility. And they may have been involved in his death a number of years ago. That's kind of a side issue we won't I, I deal with it in, in, one of my, in one of my books. So here I'm, I'm, it, makes, it makes sense here that this generation refers to the generation to whom Jesus is speaking. And in fact, all dispensationalists will, will say that this, the use of this generation here refers to that particular generation. I debated a fellow named Tommy Ice nine times. And one of the debates he told me that every time this generation is used in the Gospels. It always refers to the generation to whom Jesus is speaking, except in the next chapter, Matthew chapter 24, because this appears again. So I'm reading Matthew chapter 24. Remember, I'm an ignorant new Christian who has just been told that everything's going to come to an end before 1988, and it's based upon Bible prophecy and Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, is the key text for this. And so I get to Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, after reading Matthew 10, 23, Matthew 16, 27 through 28, and Matthew chapter 23, 36, and now I get to Matthew chapter 24, 34, and I, lo and behold, the same phrase appears. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. But I had just read Matthew chapter 24 up to that point, and I, this, sounds, this is the stuff that Hal Lindsey was telling me refers to something that's going to happen in the distant future. I was really confused. Um, and so, like Jonathan, I put eschatology on the shelf for a while uh, because I didn't, I didn't know who to go to because at that particular time, almost everybody was wound up in the, in the, la, in the um late great planet Earth fever, like a lot of people today are, are wrapped up in the left behind fever. And Billy Graham, who's going to be 95 years old, he's making predictions again about how this is the last generation and other people are doing the same thing. And uh, I'm going to get into ex to talking about the significance of, of eschatology for us as Christians. This isn't just an academic exercise. There's a reason why I got involved in this whole discussion of eschatology. So I put eschatology on the shelf for a while. And I'm in seminary by this time. So within a year, I became a Christian around February of 1973, and I'm in seminary in 1974. I would not recommend, I wouldn't recommend an ignorant new Christian going to seminary where you have to take Hebrew and Greek and church history and apologetics and that, on and on and on and on. And I, it was, I could barely, barely keep up. Because remember, I'm, I'm a guy that all he did was push a 12-pound ball. Um, and so I found myself in very unfamiliar, unfamiliar territory. You had to have a year of Greek and a year of Bible before you could even get into seminary. And so I had to, in the summer before seminary started, I had to take a year of Greek and a year of Bible in 10 weeks. So I got up every morning at 4 o'clock and studied until 7 and went to class for two hours for Greek and then had a half hour break, and then had two hours of Bible, and did that for 10 weeks. Had two tests every week in Greek, and had a test in, in, in Bible, and had to outline the entire, in the entire Bible. 
in, in, uh, in 10 weeks. That was kind of my fleece. I figured if, if, if God really wanted me in seminary, I had to be successful in those courses, and I was. But I, they didn't even count for, for seminary credit. I had to have those just to get in to seminary. But by this time, I had put eschatology on the shelf, and good thing I did because I didn't have time for it. Uh, so I went to, woke up every morning at 4, uh, went, to, went to class, ate a little lunch, took a nap for an hour, and then studied till 10. And I did that every night. Never watched a lick of TV, nothing. Didn't go anywhere. That's all I did was study. Um, it was really a rather good experience uh, for me, uh, I think. I think it was. <laughs> now, that I, now that I think about it. Um, I was, it was in Jackson, Mississippi, and I was, my room was a converted garage with no electricity, so which, with, which meant no air conditioning. But I, wasn't, I, I had gone to New Mexico State University uh, for a while, and uh, I would go to sleep at night. You just, you, no air conditioning in the dorm I was in. It was an older dorm, and I would lie down on the bed, and, and the, the, the sweat would glisten on me, and I, was, I would pray. I don't know if I prayed. I was hoping for a breeze to go across my body to cool me off. So I was used to the heat. It was no real big deal to me. Um, so, so there I was really not knowing where to go with this particular topic. And then one day I go to the seminary library and there's a library cart there. You know, you've seen a library cart with both sides of the cart. You put books on it and the librarian takes it through and reshelves the books. And the librarian had put a number of books from his library, from his personal library, on the library cart that he was selling. And like Jonathan, who went to the bookstore and found End Times Fiction, I saw this book, it was a red, faded red book, no dust jacket, that had on its uh, spine the Roman numerals XXIV. And it was on Matthew chapter 24 by a guy named Marcellus Kick, K-I-K. The book was published in 1948. I picked it up and read it and I was blown away. Because everything I was being taught in my hermeneutics classes, that is the science and art of interpretation, he was actually applying to Matthew chapter 24. And Matthew 20, 24 was starting to make all kinds of sense to me now. Now I get it. Oh, I see where this passage over here reflects on this passage here and how this, pass, this is a parallel here. and It made perfect sense to me. And so that's where my study of eschatology really began to blossom by reading Marcellus Kick's little book. It's hard, the book is hard to find now. It's now published along with his commentary on Revelation 20 called An, es An Eschatology of Victory. And, uh, and again, I want to talk a little bit about that, why that's, that's so important. Um, but that was my kind of introduction to all this. Uh, it kind of gives you a sweep of my, my history. Uh, and I, I want you to understand something, that this is not something new. What Jonathan's been teaching you and what I'm teaching other people, there's really nothing new in it. <clears throat> it's been around for a very, very long period of time. And what's really new is the dispensational system, uh, this idea that there's a, you know, the church is taken off the earth prior to a seven-year tribulation period, which is a last seven years separated from Daniel, 70 weeks, the 69th week, there's a, there's a gap in between it. That's just, pure, there's no way in the Bible that teaches that. And anytime I go somewhere, I always ask them a question. Where does, in the Bible does it say there's a gap between the 69th and 70th week? And they can't find one. There isn't one. Where is the Antichrist mentioned in Daniel's 70 weeks? It's not, there is no mention of it. Uh, where is there a gap between the third and the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation in order to get a rapture in there? And he goes on and on and on and on. Where in the New Testament does it say the temple is going to be rebuilt? Uh, where, does, where in the New Testament does it say the church is going to be taken off the earth prior to a seven-year tribulation period? There's no verse that says any of this. Uh, it's, it's amazing what people believe when there are no texts act that actually teach it. So that took me to this particular point in, in, in history for myself where I began to realize that there was really something wrong about this interpretation. But I didn't, again, didn't have enough, I really didn't have enough time to study this. 
Uh, my interest was really in the area of apologetics and uh, also into the area of cultural transformation. And so when I went out to speak at various places on a Christian worldview, how the Bible applies to every area of life, and that's something most Christians ag agree with until you start getting on the particulars, but a lot, most Christians will say, yeah, I believe the Bible applies to every area of life. But when you go out and you speak and you say, well, the Bible applies to economics, it applies to politics, it applies to medicine, it applies to journalism, it applies to education, a lot of Christians are pretty, their eyes glaze over because they've never really heard that before. They may have heard a couple of messages about how the Bible applies to economics. If you talk, you know, I guess if you listen to Larry Burkett so many years ago, he, he talked about that. Dave Ramsey talks about that now. So that's, that's a pretty popular thing. But does the Bible apply to government, civil government? Yeah, what ways does it, does it do that? Well, a lot of Christians would say, well, it applies, but they don't know how. Does the Bible deal with inflation? What is, the biblical, what is inflation? What does the Bible say about inflation? They're all, all of these different things. But so I would go out and speak to people, and the people, a lot of people in the crowd would sit there, this is, this is way too much. There's too much work involved. Uh, isn't Jesus coming back soon to rescue me out of all this? Why are we bothering? Why are we bothering with this? Why are you going to college? How many here go to college right now? Nobody? Oh, you're going, okay. Isn't there a college nearby? Don't you have a group that comes by the, No? Okay, if you're editing this, you can take this section out. <laughs> why did you go? Why did your parents send you to school at all? Why? Why bother for with, with this? Why? Look, uh, politics is 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 going to hell in a handbasket. Look what they're doing. Look what's happening around us. Why bother? Jesus is coming back soon. I've been hearing this for a long time, and I haven't been doing this. You know, compared to the whole history of this, for that long of a time. But I've been here, I've hear, heard this in the, in the 1970s. You know, the Christians really didn't get involved in politics until the late 1970s. And what was interesting about that, the people who got involved in it were the very people who told Christians, why bother getting involved? I'll give you an example of some of these, these, um, these directives from people. Um... Here's Charles Ryrie. Charles Ryrie is a huge scholar in the dispensational system. He has a book, he wrote a book called The Living End. He also has the Ryrie Study Bible. He, listen to this. Now, I, I want you to keep this in mind. You have got to understand that eschatology is not just an academic exercise. It's not just to beat the dispensationalists with. As much as you might like to do that, that's not what this is about. The integrity of Scripture is at the heart of all this, number one. Number two, eschatology has implications. What you believe about the future will determine how you live in the present and plan for the future. If, if you don't believe you have much of a future in anything, whatever it is, it will impact the way that you live in the present. It's the way it is. I, I've, I've seen people give up on life literally and die. They do it. And I've seen other people who fight to stay alive and they, they, they'll beat a disease or at least extend their, their life in doing so. If you've ever been in athletics, if you go, if you go into a, a, an athletic contest thinking you're going to lose, you've given the opposition probably 30 or 40 percent an advantage over you. It's amazing what psychology there is in believing that you're going to do well in something. I mean, we all know that. So put that in the big picture about you're being told that the end is right around the corner. There is no fixing any of this. It's a prophetic inevitability that there's going to be a war in the Middle East. Now, there may be a war in the Middle East, but does that mean everything's going to blow up? It's going to be the end? We've had two world wars in the last, in, in, in the last century, two. And everybody believed that World War I was the end. World War II was the end. Uh, and before that, you can go back to the French Revolution. You can, you can go to every single generation in history, and you will see that every generation 
had prophecy pundits who were out there using the same verses they're using today to, as evidence that the end was coming in their day. We have a book out there called The Day and the Hour. I don't have it here. And it's a history of date setting. 2,000, almost 2,000 years of people making predictions about who the Antichrist was. I, have a, I, have a, I probably have one of the, the largest private collections on Bible prophecy. I, anytime, I have long playing records. How many people know what a long playing record is? You know, so this disc of vinyl and has this groove that goes all the way around like this and you put a needle on it and actually sound comes out. I mean, that, how archaic is that? I mean, a day will come when people will, you'll put this on, the, on Facebook and say, can you identify this? And those people say they have no idea what this thing is. And it wasn't that long ago. And that technology really hadn't, hadn't changed much since Thomas Edison accidentally invented the phonograph recording. You know what the first thing he recorded was? Mary had a little lamb. That's what he recorded. It was an accident. And that's how we got records. Vinyl, then they became vinyl, and then long plane, and so forth. It was funny, put a hole in the middle of it, drop it down, needle. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. Today, I mean, you all, you all have phones, and you have tons and tons of music on it. Uh, and when I was in college, you had this you know, the bigger receiver that you could get, an amplifier you could get, big speakers, and then all of your albums lined up, and then it was all built on uh, cinder blocks because you couldn't afford anything else. You could afford this huge stereo system, but you couldn't afford the table that to put it on. And today, it's all, look, think of this, just thousands and thousands and thousands of recordings on a little device. It's amazing. Eschatology matters. You think if Steve Jobs thought, I can't do this, he didn't, he'd never conceived of such a thing. But Christians sit around and they say, we can't do this. It's a prophetic inevitability that you can't make an iPod. And you wouldn't do it. You'd sit back and say, well, I, you know, I, I still don't think we could do it. Well, that's why this eschatological stuff is, is so important. Uh, if someone's telling you that the end is near, it's going to have an impact. And, if, and if, millions, if millions of Christians across America believe that, it's going to have an impact on everything that we come in contact with. And the reason the United States is in a mess isn't because of the humanists, the secularists, or the atheists, or the homosexuals. It's because Christians have sat back and done nothing for, for, two, for, two, for two primary reasons. One, they've been taught this eschatological thing, nonsense. And the other thing is they've said that there's a sacred, 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 secular dichotomy. The Bible only applies to this. It doesn't apply to this. And so we've got to separate those things. So I can't bring my religion into the classroom. And, of course, that's exactly where we are today. Christians have fallen for that, too. But I think people now, they have a biblical excuse as to why they shouldn't be involved because of the eschatological issue. And they've got all the charts and so forth and to prove to you that the end is coming. And they're using the same Bible passages that people 100 years, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700 years have used to prove that the end was coming in their day. And I'll give you a good example of this. Um, Oswald, uh, Oswald J. Smith wrote a book on the Antichrist in 1926. So 1926. And that book detailed who he believed the Antichrist was based upon what he says was Bible prophecy. He believed the Antichrist was Mussolini, Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy. I'm sad to say I'm, my grandparents are, both sets of grandparents parents are from Italy. And um, so I'm a pure Italian descent. My last name is really DeMario, not just DeMar. But my grandfather, in order to Americanize the name, went with DeMar. So a lot of people think it's either Dutch or French, but it's really Italian. But Benito Mussolini. And so we, here we have Oswald J. Smith making this prediction, with laying out all the Bible verses that the Antichrist was Mussolini. Well, if you know anything about Mussolini, Mussolini was killed and hanged in 1945, that was a big embarrassment to Oswald J. Smith, which I've, I've got to give the guy credit. Anytime he went to speak somewhere, 
he would go and he would say, if you have a copy of this book, I'll, I'll, buy, it, I'll buy it back from you. There are very few of those books around. I have a couple of copies of them. So I've seen the book. I have the book. A lot of guys don't, they don't apologize. They just go on and they hope people will forget and they get a new, new younger crowd of people who don't know anything about Hal Lindsey's predictions in 1948, about 1948 into 1988. He's still out there peddling this prophecy propaganda. And people never, never seem to question him on it. Uh, and what's interesting, in 1977, Hal Lindsey was interviewed by, by um, uh, Ward Gasquay, and Gasquay said, well, Mr. Lindsey, what if you're wrong? And Lindsey says, well, there's only a split-second difference between being a hero and a bum. And I guess if I'm wrong, I'll be a bum. Well, he wasn't a bum. He's still out there selling this stuff, and he's still invited to all these conferences. And I get in trouble because I point this out to people. I'm the bad guy. He makes his prediction, I point it out to people, and they get upset with me for pointing it out. It's, it's really, truly amazing. So back to these, these statements by these guys. Uh, Charles Ryrie said, This world is not going to get any easier to live in. Almost unbelievably hard times lie ahead. Indeed, Jesus said that these coming days will be uniquely terrible. Nothing in all the previous history of the world can compare with what lies in store for mankind. Well, you read that, and it's a prophetic inevitability. How can you fight against it? Why bother? Like we haven't had the Black Death that went through Europe and probably killed somewhere between a third to a half of the population. I don't think that's anything on the horizon like that. The Lisbon earthquake of 1755. Uh, earthquakes that were, uh, I mean, volcanoes that you could literally hear around the world. People talk about the, you know, there's an increase in the number and, and uh, size of, of, of earthquakes today. And that's a sign of the end. And yet the passage in Matthew chapter 24 doesn't say there will be more big earthquakes. It just says there will be, earth, there'll be earthquakes in various places. We've always had earthquakes. We've always had famines. In fact, if you look at Acts chapter 11, there was a famine throughout the entire Roman Empire during that first century. False prophets, you've heard all this, 1 John chapter 4 verse 1. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. So there's nothing unique going on today, of course they say, except Israel becoming a nation again. The problem with that is the New Testament doesn't say anything about that being a sign. They try to say it's the fig tree. Well, if the fig tree is Israel in Matthew chapter 24, then the fig tree is Israel in chapter 21. And chapter 21 says, when Jesus curses the fig tree, what does he say about the fig tree? There will never be fruit on it again. Yikes. And so this is some dispensationalists have gotten, finally got the message, and so they don't say the, the fig tree in Matthew 24 is the fig tree because they, they see the contradiction in their view. And so we are at a real crossroad here in terms of, of eschatology. There's a major shift taking place. And Jonathan is at, you know, he's, when, in his particular area, he's out there making this point. I'm doing my thing. And you, I, I can't go into the details of some very, very famous people who you would know who have actually abandoned the whole left behind scenario and have adopted this particular position because they believe it's a biblical position. Listen to this. What a way to live with optimism, with anticipation, with excitement. We should be living like persons who don't expect to be around much longer. Okay, so there's a 2014 election coming up, 2016 election. You know, we should be living like persons who don't expect to be around much longer. Why, why bother? Why bother trying to change the government at any level? Look, by the way, I don't believe government is our salvation at all. I want to get involved and change the government to have it do less governing, not more governing. So, so please, please keep, keep that in mind. Um, it's just rather amazing to me that someone could, could say something like that. And that was said in 1970, so that's what, uh, 40, is that right? 43 years ago. So can you imagine what, what has taken place politically and socially in 43 years? 
How is it that the homosexual population, which is probably at most 2%, has had all these laws passed, and Christians in this country, probably at 30% and more, can't do anything? It's because we don't. Here's another one. I don't like cliches, but I've heard it said, God didn't send me to clean the fishbowl, he sent me to fish. And I'm thinking, that's, oh, isn't that, I can just hear people say, that's just a great saying. And he says, in a way, there's, a, there's truth in that. Yeah, there's truth in it, all right. If you don't clean the fishbowl, what happens to the fish? They die. <laughs> so if you don't clean the cultural fishbowl, what happens? They, they die. Our culture is dying because we have not cleaned the cultural fishbowl because many Christians believe that the end times are right around the corner and there's nothing we can do to change anything. Ted Peters writes that dispensationalism functions to justify social irresponsibility, and many find this doctrine a comfort in their lethargy. And so you got people sitting back and say, I read the newspaper and I see all these going on, things going on, and they'll say, Jesus is coming back soon. It's evidence that Jesus is about to return. And they've been rocking away for 40-some years saying the same thing, and they're seeing their culture go down, and they, they're in, in anticipation. And I see a lot. I go out and I'll talk on this subject, and people say, "You're taking my hope away. You're taking my hope away." I said, "What is your hope?" She said, "The rapture is my hope." And I said, "The Apostle Paul was not on trial for the rapture of the church. He was on trial for the resurrection of the dead." There's a huge difference. And I hate to tell you, to tell you, but you're going to die. That's not a comforting thing. And that, what do you think is easier to sell to people? You're going to be raptured, you're never going to die, or you're going to die. You're going to die. Get used to it. But in your death, you have got to leave a legacy. That means in your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, you, you should have multiple generations in mind. Uh, uh, Psalm 78, multiple generations in mind. You need to be leaving a legacy behind. While the unbelievers are aborting their children left and right, we need to be having more children. And we need to be training them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We don't want to be sending out an ignorant Christians just to have children. So, that's why eschatology is important. It, the, the, Bible, the Bible is on trial in terms of eschatology, and at the same time, our culture is on trial because of eschatology. How many of you have ever heard of Bart Ehrman? Bart Ehrman is a, he's an academic. Uh, he teaches New Testament studies. And he used to be, he used to go to Moody Bible College. And he was caught up in the whole left behind scenario. Well, it wasn't left behind back then. It was the Hal Lindsey, Lake Ray Planet Earth. He and I are probably, he's probably a little younger than I am. So he grew up with all that. He ends up going to seminary and his professor starts saying, well, maybe the Bible's wrong, and this whole eschatology thing is wrong. So Bart Ehrman, one of the reasons why he's a Christian skeptic today, it's one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons he's a religious skeptic today is because he believed the dispensational Hal Lindsey, Tim LaHaye, Tim LaHaye's been writing Bible, Bible prophecy long before Left Behind. I think Tim LaHaye's like in his 80s now. Um, and I think Hal Lindsey is too. And, he, and what Bart Ehrman said was, it's obvious Jesus was wrong in Matthew chapter 24. And so if Jesus was wrong in Matthew chapter 24, then he was probably wrong in other things too, so the Bible's in error. And so he rejected the New Testament based upon so, some of this. And it's in one, one of his, um, I think it's in his book called Misquoting Jesus. It's, it's interesting when in that book, there's all kinds of typographical errors in it, but that's, an, that's another thing. Um, but see, there are lots of people who have rejected the Christian faith based upon prophecy. Because they went through Matthew chapter 24, they read it, it seems to be teaching that Jesus would return before that generation passed away. Jesus did not return, therefore Jesus was wrong, and he, not so much he was a false prophet, but he was a deluded prophet. Not diluted, but deluded. He was just mistaken. And so he was probably wrong in other things too. And uh, we produced a debate uh, a few years ago. I don't know if you've ever heard of Christopher Hitchens. 
Uh, Christopher Hitchens was a, he didn't, he didn't call himself an atheist, he called himself an anti-theist. Very articulate, very articulate guy, but he was opposed to Christianity, he was opposed to all religion. His brother, by the way, Peter Hitchens, is a Christian. Uh, but we produced a debate between Christopher Hitchens and Doug Wilson. And in that debate, the Matthew chapter 24 came up. And Christopher Hitchens says, well, this was obviously a mistake. And Doug Wilson said, no. Jesus said he would return before that generation passed away, and he did. And Christopher Hitchens just kind of sat there and mumbled something. I don't remember what it was, because he had never heard that before. And I can imagine a dispensationalist trying to... I, I was telling Jonathan, I said, he'd be still trying to explain Matthew 24 and how it really didn't mean what Jesus specifically said it meant. So that's just kind of an introduction into this whole eschatological issue. And, and it, it, it shows you how I got into this as a result of some diff difficult passages that did not fit the dispensational end time scenario. And also because I believe that eschatology has cultural implications. Because what you believe about the future will indeed determine how you live in the present and plan for the future. Uh, and let me give you, um, I got about 20 minutes. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give you two biblical stories to show you how important this is, okay? Two biblical stories that have really impacted me over the years. Uh, and these are stories that you're obviously familiar with. Uh, numbers 13 and 14, hardly anybody ever goes into Numbers, but Numbers 13 and 14, it's the story about God sending the 12 spies out into the promised land. Remember the story? And if you read chapter 13, God says, I'm going to send you out to the land that I'm going to give to you. So here's the promise. God says, I'm going to give you the land. All right? So you got the promise. This is God telling you, I'm going to do something, and you're going to get the land. Okay? What would you think? If God told you he was going to do something for you, would you believe him? Sure you would. No matter what you saw or what you experienced, the thing you would keep in your mind was what? God said we're going to get this land. So you know the story. The 12 spies go out into the land. And they stay there for how long? 40 days. What did God say the land was going to be like? It was going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. It was going to be a bountiful land. Forty days later, the twelve come back, and in fact, the bunches of grapes that they bring back takes two men to carry them back. Okay. And so Moses asks for a report. And ten of the spies say what? There are giants in the land, and we look like grasshoppers in their sight. Was that true? No, yeah, probably. I mean, if, if this fruit that we brought back is any indication of how big things are, you can imagine what these, this, op, the, this, this formidable opposition is like. Two of the spies, who were the two spies who didn't deny there were giants in the land, but did say we were supposed to go into the land and take it because God had promised it? Joshua and Caleb. Uh, Caleb, by the way, means dog. Uh, he, was, he was probably a convert, uh, convert to, to, um, to Israel, or if, if not that, he was really on the outs. But here, here you got Joshua and Caleb never denying that. And they said, well, we need to take the land because God said so. And so Moses puts it to a vote. What do the, what do the people vote for? They vote not to go into the land. And so what happens? What happens to them? What happens to Israel? For every day that they, the 12 spies are in the land, God keeps them in the wilderness for a year. So they're 40 years stuck in the wilderness. Why? Because they didn't believe God's promise that he was going to give them the land. Now, God is to, what has God told us? That we will do what? We will inherit the earth. That's what he said. And what do we say today? There are giants in the land, and we look like grasshoppers in their sight, and we can't do anything, but we have an escape hatch. It's called the rapture. See, Joshua and Caleb didn't have the rapture. 
But we have a rapture. So we can say there are giants and we can't change anything because we've got a rapture. Something the Bible doesn't teach. So 40 years pass. They finally go into the land. This time, Joshua may be learning something from Moses. Uh, sends two spies this time, and they encounter Rahab. And you know what happens. You know, the, they're spies. The enemy's looking for them. In chapter 2, listen to this. Now, before they lay down, Rahab came up to them on the roof and said to the men, Now, listen. I want you to listen to this. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how, you, how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what, did, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And when we heard it, our hearts melted and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Did you, did you catch what she said? When we heard about it. She only heard about it and believed. They saw it and didn't believe. We've had thousands of years of history to see how God has delivered his people. We, the Christians still don't believe it. Because they've got this escape hatch. They always got, they got this thing that says we're going to be raptured out of here. So that's, you know, that puts you in a predicament. We don't have to worry about the, this, all these things and fighting all these enemies because God's going to take us out. Since 1970 to, ni- to 2013, we're still here. We're actually still left three years beyond what they were in the wilderness. And they're still teaching that we can't do anything to change anything because of this doctrine called the rapture. Now I want you to go to the New Testament. First Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy 3. Who's Timothy? Timothy is a young pastor. What are the, what are the conditions of the period? Uh, the, Roman, the, 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 the Roman Empire is in charge of everything. Okay? If you're a Jew, you're, a second, you're, not, even a, you're not even a second class citizen. You have no citizenship privileges at all. Uh, you, uh, the Apostle Paul, remember in the book of Acts, he's about to be beaten by a Roman soldier. And Paul says, will you beat a Roman soldier? And the, the army official said, I... I, he said, are you a Roman citizen? And Paul says, I, I was born a Roman citizen. He had dual citizenship. He, he was born a Roman citizen. And the Roman soldier said, I had to buy my citizenship. But the typical Jew did not have any citizenship privileges. That's why the Jews in Jesus' day went to the, to the, the civil officials of Rome to get Jesus crucified because they had no power to do it. So you had no citizenship rights. So you have to understand something. You're under the boot of Rome. You're being taxed by Rome. You're being spied on by Rome. This is NSA type stuff. They always knew where you were going. You couldn't just travel anywhere you wanted to go. They had soldiers in Jerusalem. Think about that. It'd be like a foreign army coming here and setting up a garrison around here to keep you all in line. That's where the Christian church began. In the midst of the of the the greatest empire, secular empire of the world, the Roman Empire. If you look on a map, the Roman Empire goes all the way up into England, maybe probably even to Scotland, takes the northern part of, of Egypt. It, the, the, the known world, Rome was in fact in charge of it. And the Christian church is birthed in that, in that period of time. Not only do you have the Romans against you, but you have the Jews against you, because they hate They hate this new Messiah. And so you have civil officials against you and you have religious officials against you. And who knows what that, we know what caused it. You go through the book of Acts and you'll see very early on that the the, the new Christians were were really beaten up by by the Jews and not by the Romans. It wasn't until later on where the church was perceived as a political threat that Rome came in. It was, the same, it was the same false charge that was brought against Jesus. 
Remember that? He says he, he preaches there's, this, there's another king and not to pay taxes to Caesar. They lied in order to get Jesus crucified. And even when, and even when Pilate wanted to release Jesus, 